Thank you, everybody. And um, I'm very happy to uh, that um, a member of the Orwell Society has been given this opportunity of talking to DJ Taylor, um, particularly as we approach uh, his forthcoming series of annotated works. Um, six years ago in April 2015, um, Sylvia Topp, the biographer of Eileen, uh, Orwell's wife, and I walked into the uh, the doors of the, walked through the doors of the Lytton Phil in Newcastle. Um, it was part of uh, an anniversary event, a visit by the Orwell Society to Tyneside. And we were commemorating events which had occurred uh, on Tyneside in March and April, 1945. Um, Later on, David and I will open our discussion into a conversation, but I'm going to start with a few questions to David to get some facts out. And the first question is, quite simply, why was George Orwell in Jesmond in Newcastle on April the 4th, 1945, please? Good evening, Les, and everybody out there. Very good to be here. It's only a shame I can't be in the Lytton Phil itself, sitting down and enjoying its hospitality. But hi to you all. Um, I can see that uh, you're determined to make uh, the northeast of England the kind of locus classicus of Orwell studies this evening. And of course, the, what was being celebrated, well, not celebrated, commemorated, of course, was the death of Eileen, Eileen Orwell, Orwell's first wife, Eileen O'Shaughnessy, as she previously was. And um, of course, the connection with, uh, with the northeast, with Teesside and Tyneside, is very strong because um, Eileen. Uh, had been brought up um, South Shields, went to Sunderland High School, um, her, <clears throat> had lived up her, um, her sister-in-law, um, had a house there after her brother Lawrence died, which she stayed a lot with young Richard Blair in 1944-45. And it was in a nursing home up in the North East that she died on the operating table in March 1945, um, leaving her husband a, um, a widower at the age of something like 42, 41, 42. So, um, the, the power that the North East exerted over Orwell was, uh, was comparatively strong, I think, during the last stages of his life. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 um, already, um, Eileen um, wasn't known for her writing, although some writing and, and some fantastic uh, revelatory letters have been discovered long after she died but she had written and published a poem in 1935 called 1984 for the uh, anniversary of um, Sunderland High School. Um, but as events turned out, in George Orwell's life, other writers from the Northeast um, became important to him, particularly in the 1930s. Um, could you tell us who they are and what they- They, they did. I mean, the, the Northeast, um... We talk about the rise of the working class novel in the interwar era and quite a lot of what we'll call in inverted com commas working class writers came from the northeast at this time uh, a very famous book published in 1935 by harry heslop last, last cage down uh, one of the greats of depression era classics uh, but the two the two writers whom i most associate with orwell in the context of the northeast were his friend jack common um, who was the, worked on the Adelphi in the early 1930s and with whom all became friendly. Uh, Jack Common, in fact, um, was allowed to live at Wallington while um, Orwell and Eileen were away in, in uh, Morocco in the winter of 1938-39. And there are some very funny letters back from Orwell asking about whether the goat has been mated and uh, successfully, and did he actually observe the spectacle, a most unedifying spectacle if you happen to watch Orwell writes in one of these letters. And Common subsequently, I mean, after Orwell's death, wrote a very, very brilliant novel, Kidder's Luck, which I think is one of the great hindsight novels of the post-war era. Um, he was a friend. I'm also fascinated, although there is very little to go on, unfortunately, fascinated by Orwell's, uh, you can barely call it a relationship, but his dealings with Sid Chaplin. Uh, now, Sid Chaplin, uh, I think whose dates are something like 1916 to 1986, seven, um, to my mind, is one of the great Tyneside writers, one of the great Northeastern writers, um, sadly neglected, I think, um, in the modern era. But um, Orwell encouraged him. I mean, when he was still, when Chaplin was still working down the pit in his 20s, Orwell encouraged him when he was literary editor of Tribune and uh, printed some of his early short stories in 1943 44. 
but there's an, an awful story. I mean, we talk um, we talk about um, the the um, you know the the, the well intentioned but inevitably class conscious middle class literateurs attempt to connect you know with the people beneath him in the social and literary pyramid in the 1940s. And I was told, what well, in retrospect is an awful story by Sid Chaplin's widow. And in fact, I was told it at the Lytton Phil about 16 and 17 years ago. And Orwell, at this point, Orwell and Eileen were living in, in the Maisonette in Kilburn. This is about 1943, 1944, before they, were, before they were bombed out. Not a very genteel area. They were simply living in a middle class, you know, in a Maisonette. They didn't have very much money. But Orwell suggested to Sid Chaplin in a letter that, uh, you know, in the way that one did, that it, should he ever happen to be in London, that you must come and look us up. So, uh, so, so Chaplin, the miner, did have some occasion to be in London in 1943, and greatly, you know, immensely trepidatious, he turned up on the Orwell's doorstep in Kilburn um, in NW6. And, and as his widow, really Chaplin, told me, he came up to the front door and he could see that beyond, he could hear the sound of voices and he divined that behind the glass window, the front door, some kind of party or social event was going on. And his courage failed him. And rather than knocking on the door and, you know, sort of greeting his literary hero, or well, the man who'd sponsored his work, he turned around and went, went home and never, and never ever met. And the, so the two never met. So it was a relationship conducted entirely by post and on the telephone. And it, that, that, it's such a, such a poignant story, you know, in the light of Chaplin's later career. And all Orwell did in his great respect and reverence for the working class writing of the 30s and 40s, the Chaplin should actually have been scared of ringing the doorbell and had turned on his heel and fled. The, um, there's a great book um, about Orwell and, and Arthur Kersler uh, by Jenny Calder called uh, Chronicles of Conscience, which has got a good chapter in it on um, Orwell and, and factual reporting. Um, and I'm not sure if they mention in there sort of the last factual sort of association with this area is um, Mark Benny and his book, uh, Charity Maine. Mark, Mark Benny, very strange character, um, had become a, a mine manager late in the war and, and wrote the novel about it, which Orwell gave a very good review to. Um, but there's a whole area there to be explored of, of still on Orwell and reportage and just by chance, it takes us back to that northeastern area. Charity, Maine, I think, is meant to be slightly nearer to Durham than than Newcastle, but um, it's it's worth checking out. Um, but if we go back in history, and I'm I'm now going to force this connection. There is one more Tyneside connection, uh, a last literary connection during World War One. A Russian naval engineer had worked on Tyneside. His name was Yevgeny Zamyatin. When he wrote, when he went back to Russia, he wrote a novel about the people he'd met called The Islanders. Um, but later on, when he went back to Russia and he developed from a naval engineer into a, a novelist, he wrote another work which would become very significant both to Orwell and also to Orwell's critics who sometimes allege that Orwell plagiarised it. Not that I believe that, but if you could tell us about Yevgeny Zamyatin, please. Mm. Well, the novel We was, um, I think, at least predates, certainly for dates in the early 1920s, as far as I recall, and various curious editions sort of floated around and translations. And it was one of those novels that became, I think in the 1940s, became a kind of fetish for Orwell. It was something he was trying to get hold of. He knew at second hand of its importance, but he didn't actually read it until a French translation turned up in 1946, whereupon he uh, he wrote about it avidly, again, I think in an essay in Tribune, and uh, also pressed it among publishers. I mean, he tried very hard to get uh, Fred Warburg to publish it at Fred Warburg in the later 1940s. Um, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating novel. Um, I wouldn't, um, I would not say that, um, in fact, a new edition of just, a new English translation just come out, which I bought earlier this year. I wouldn't say that Orwell plagiarises in any respect, but mm -hmm. it certainly fits into, there's a kind of, um, if, if we're looking at the chain of literary association from which, which ultimately leads to 1984, there's a very significant review uh, written, I think, at the height of the Blitz in 1940, where Orwell reviews a selection of, of early 20th century dystopia, 
uh, Wells. He reviews Ernest Bramer's The Secret of the League, Jack London. Um, and uh, you can see that he's kind of beginning to think his way into the sort of mindset that was produced in 1984. And I think that we is another one of those novels that fits into this framework. I mean, it's set in a, uh, a future that has gone wrong, uh, where people have no individual identities, but simply refer to by their numbers. There's the illicit love affair, there's the, the mind control, there's the all-seeing state surveillance. So it does, it, it fits in very firmly into the framework, I think, which, which 1984 was conceived, nurtured, yes. And there's, there's always the outside possibility that Zamyatin had met Eileen's father. Uh, Eileen's father was a senior customs officer on Tyneside and Zamyatin must have liaised with him or could have liaised with him on the release of the icebreaker boats which needed to be sent to Russia. So there's always the possibility that she herself had met him. When, um, when Orwell took the um, Gleb Struve's book home to read about Russian literature, which is where he first heard Zamyatin's name, it's possible that Eileen picked it up and realized this is a man that I once met, but we're not so sure. But um, there's an awful lot about um, Orwell. Um, and specifically, you've given your title, um, uh, Annotating Orwell. His work can be read simply, but it, it gains an awful lot if we if we know what Orwell was reading and thinking. Um, when, in fact, you're, there's, there's always more to be discovered. In fact, you're, you're, um, you're going to write not an updated version of your biography of Orwell, but you're going to write a completely new biography of Orwell That's because right, yes. so much, mm. so much has been discovered about him. And I've noticed that um, last year or the year before last, when Dorian Linsky published his book, um, The Ministry of Truth, he called it a biography of 1984. And similarly, when you published your book on 1984, you subtitled it a biography as well. Do you think that biography is the best way into, um, into Orwell's, uh, reading I, Orwell's I, works? I, I think I'm, I, I, I suppose I would sound very pragmatic about this. And I think whatever, um, whatever methods you think are the best ones, then those should serve. I like Doran Linsky's book very much. My own book, which was not my idea actually, but an American publishers uh, was simply treating the book in terms of where did it come from? What were the ideas that, that fed into it? And then the story of the actual writing of it. I mean, the, the fascinating thing to me about 1984 is how long it took him to write it, because yeah. Orwell was a quick worker, one of the great fluent and you know, capable of writing a novel while writing, you know, all kinds, four or five pits of journalism a week. Um, and yet, given that he got the idea um, of 1984 from watching the, the Outer Conference at the end of 1943, um, it took him five and a half years from the original conception to the actual publication. Now, I know a lot of that time he was in failing health, he wasn't well, and he was relocating himself to Bureau with all the logistical problems that, that entailed. Um, but it's a novel that took an awful lot of thought, an awful lot of the, it, it's so, in, in writing a biography of it is in some ways um, a rather useful step because it, it really is piece by piece. You know, a few, he wrote a few pages to start with, then he stopped, then he had another go. And all the time you can see him, we were talking just now about his, you know, his reading We for the first time in early 1946, which obviously administered, you know, some kind of prod, some kind of impetus. But then all through the period, 1945, six, seven, um, if you follow, if you read his, if you read the, um, the journalism he was writing at the time, you can kind of almost see in which the way in which his mind is working, picking up little fragments, writing little essays, which um, explain or ventilate some of his ideas about the future of the post-war world. I was always very struck by um, You and the Atom Bomb, which is published in the autumn of 1945, which kind of sets out his vision of the great territorial land masses that are gonna boss the post-war world. And this in itself is then picked up for 1984 for 1984, whose, you know, whose first draft will then begin the following spring. So it's a very, very piecemeal process. And you can see all these, all the little, the shot fragments of this mosaic being assembled almost from week to week in the way that his mind was working, mm -hmm. which I suppose is an argument for annotating 1984 to point out some of these kind of causes and connections. Well, I, I suppose one thing, again, we don't know is at what point he stopped writing his family trilogy, The Lion and the Unicorn, mm. 
nothing to do with the book actually published called The Lion and the Unicorn, mm. which was um, from the little bit that we know was was a something like the background to, to keep the Aspidistra flying, but was about um, a miserable existence getting a big worse. Generation, a generational saga, wasn't it? I mean, it probably all goes back to Goldsworthy. I mean, one of his very first printed essays uh, in 1928, <clears throat> was on for a French newspaper. And I think he's, um, you know, one of the things about all which I think is very important in terms of his literary development is that generally speaking, his tastes were very old fashioned. You, know, you can see this in a lot of the incidental references to fiction that turn up in the early novels. I mean, one of the great tasks awaiting anybody who sets out to annotate Orwell's novels is the references to what are now some very obscure works of early 20th century English fiction. I, I think you're right. Um, and the, um, the, the, um, the, the point about the, the, um, the geography, etc., which you mentioned in you and, and the atomic and uh, you and the atom bomb is that um, one of the influences, because Orwell wrote a lot about it, was James Burnham's book, The Managerial Revolution. Now, mm. there's no evidence that was published in 1940, but there's no evidence that Orwell read the 1940 hardback. It was published in paperback by Pelican in either 1944 or 1945, mm. along with um, along with um, Mackinder's book on uh, on the, the the world heartland, which is where Orwell gets the phrase um, who, who controls the past them, controls yeah. the future. Yeah. Um, so it, uh, it looks as if the the availability of those two Pelican books gave a, an impetus to his thinking to provide a skeleton of thought. It's I, always I struck me. Sorry, sorry I on. agree. The, uh, the, the crucial thing about um, James Burnham and the managerial revolution is um, Orwell, one of the, I mean, Orwell was obviously very, very interested in this and writes about it on more than one occasion. And he makes the point at one stage, which is, and again, foresees to a certain extent the world of 1984, he says, the future, you know, up until now, the, the you know, what the world pretty much has been bossed by generals and armies. In the future, it will be bossed by managers and technocrats. And all of a sudden, you get an idea of a new kind of almost professionally run world, you know, where, the, where it's going to be people sitting in offices and looking at screens who are going to run things rather than, um, you know, mighty armies careering over the globe. Um, if I could just make, I, I, I think, a, before we start, I, mean, I know you're very keen to sort of talk about individual novels and, um, and what. No, 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 I'll be guided by you. Well, I was going to make the general point I was going to make um, when one, you know, are you asking oneself the question of why would one want to annotate Orwell's novels? Um, and uh, the, one of the reasons is, especially those, the four novels written in the 1930s is like, um, like all almost all novels written in that era, they, they're beginning to show their age, by which, by which I mean they are full of incidental references, they're full of slang, they're full of uh, the literature of the time. Um, you know, you, you only have to read the first couple of chapters of Keep the Aspidistra Flying. And I mean, I'm, you know, I was born a quarter of a century after Keep the Aspidistra was flying, and I just about get it. Uh, but somebody half my age, I would think, would really be struggling to take in some of the incidental detail of that novel. And it's the same with Orwell's lesser contemporaries. You know, if I was rereading uh, J.B. Priestley's Angel Pavement the other week and thinking, you know, a lot of this is simply inco would be incomprehensible for someone who moves in a world of smartphones and tablets, this, this kind of thing. You know, just simply the, and um, another novel too, which I, again, which I reread re recently, in fact, written by someone with whom, Orwell, by, with whom Orwell crossed swords, and that's Norman Collins, with whom he had such rows when he worked in, when Collins worked at Gillans in the 1930s. And um, Collins wrote an labyrinth, an extremely long novel in 1945 called London Belongs to Me. And again, it's full of examples of the way in which people talk and the catchphrases of the 1930s and 40s. And so when somebody walks into a room and the light switch fails, he immediately turns around and says to his friend, where was Moses? And of course, that I can remember my father telling me that catchphrase, where was Moses when the light went out? In the dark. Now, you know, a lot of this guy, so as well as simply explaining all the incidental detail, to add to that, you've then got um, the, men, the, the frequent incidents when you can see something autobiographical going on where Orwell is making a reference that connects to his own life, that connects to some friend of his, that connects to some situation that he was involved in. This is especially true of um, 
A Clergyman's Daughter, um, which is the novel he wrote when uh, recuperating from serious illness in his parents' home in Southwold um, in the early part, uh, in the first six, seven months of 1934. Now, um, in terms of what that novel tells us about Orwell's life and his connection with Southwold and some of the people who are living in Southwold, I mean, the thing is, as far as I can see, it's, an ex it's, it's a huge acrostic, you know, which I, I don't think even, I mean, I've... <laughs> You know, I, I have produced, I think, 13 pages of footnotes, of endnotes on the clergyman's daughter. And I don't think I've got anywhere near to the bottom of it yet. It's just so abstruse to some of the sort of connections and the things and the insinuations that Orwell was, was making about some of the people there who were virtually his neighbours. Yes, it's full yes. of private jokes. It's full of little vendettas he's pursuing with local people. It's full of sort of sly references to his emotional life. And yet none of this is particularly apparent on the surface. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it um, and and yet there's a very strange feature about a clergyman's daughter, which is he calls it Knipe Hill, which mm. sounds like one of the five towns from Arnold Bennett's novels of the five towns. I, mm. it, I've, I've forgotten which one of the not five towns I'm thinking of, but it definitely sounds like Knipe. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Orwell did have Arnold Bent, what Arnold Bennett called the interestingness of experience. Um, and, and, and somewhere he said, oh, I've got all these things and I want to get them in. Um, I think that's, cer that's certainly true of, I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, without um, boring senseless anybody watching here who hasn't actually read A Clergyman's Daughter, who, haven't re who hadn't read it recently, um, to take one example is um, how he goes around naming his characters. I mean, the number of private jokes that go into, the, into the, simply the names of some of the minor characters. Uh, to give you an example, I mean, there's... Uh, there's a minor character called Dr. Gaythorne. Now, it just so happens that um, Gaythorne Hardy is the family name of the Earls of Cranbrook, who happened to be the local magnates with whose sons all had been eaten with. Um, there's, there's a marvellous, uh, there's, there's the wonderfully named Miss Mayfield, you know, the elderly lady who may or may who probably won't contribute any money to the upkeep of the church. And this is in the great Victorian figurative, uh, give, giving characters figurative names like Dr. Filgrave, um, Trollope's doctor, or Mr. Bloodier, Thackeray's literary critic. There's that. There's also the, the religious, the, the religious grounding of it. I mean, you you or you need to read some several very serious books about the Anglican Church and its controversies in the 1930s to be able to get to the heart of what Orwell is saying about um, religious. I mean, he, he really was, you know, this was the time in his life when he was going to church, as far as we can tell quite seriously taking in the church times and keeping up with Anglican controversy. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the, the first 70 pages of The Clergyman's Daughter is a real kind of, uh, a, a really quite sort of learned, um, learned investigation of some of the problems that uh, English Christianity was going through in the early 1930s. Yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a superb scene where, where Dorothy is um, um, making... Uh, Clothes for the children's that's show. Right, with, with Victor Stone, the audience, and, and they talk to each other in terms. Of, they did in terms of. So he so she says, "I think yours is him thirty-one. He denied I pitched my pitch my tent at base mark near a room." Now you had to quite sort of au fait clerical matters in the early nineteen thirties to be able to write that kind of thing. I think, but it's the same when you get on to um, keep the Astrid for flying, which is full of people who've been given names of Orwell's friends, or full of terribly sort of sly incidental references that need decoding. I mean, there's the, there's, um, I, I always, I'm, I'm not, I always pride myself on being the first person to have discovered this, but there's that, uh, there's the wonderful poem, um, you know, which, where he's, he's, he stands in the bookshop and the window trying to write the poem, which, which is obviously, which is based on St. Andrew's Day, 1934. <clears throat> and it's the final lines, um, I always maintain, are the first reference in English poetry to a condom. The sleek, the, the, the sleek estranging sealed, sealed between the lover and his bride. 1930, 1936, that was published. I don't know of any earlier reference than that in English poetry. I may be wrong. Mm. No, it's, it's a good point. But uh, um, the um, what I went back to um, while I was thinking about this, uh, this, uh, this event was, um, again, in A Clergyman's Daughter, looking at the, the, the teacher, Mrs. Creevy, for whom Dorothy mm -hmm. goes to work, a most mm -hmm. dreadful woman, uh, the, the way she cuts up the eggs for breakfast. But it reminded me of, of something that Orwell wrote in his essay on Charles Dickens. Um, 
He said when he produces a really subtle and damaging portrait like John Dorrit or uh, Harold Skimpole, mm. it is generally of some rather middling, unimportant person. And it struck me when I was reading about Mrs. McCree, Mrs. Creevy, that again, Orwell was doing the same thing, but she's a minor character and, and yet he's able to skewer her. Um, um, does, does he lose some of his strength by this, this attack on minor characters um, in these early novels? And, and later on, Animal Farm in 1984 becomes so much greater because he is able to concentrate uh, his powers on the more significant figures. I think there is something in that. Uh, there is a kind of sense, certainly in some of those early books, in which he's doing what... Um, I remember once... Um, uh, Alan Ross, I think it was, who uh, reviewed an, an, an Angus Wilson novel and said that the trouble with Wilson was that amusing and um, intelligent as he was, that his theory of characterization was merely bayoneting corpses. In other words, his, his, his characters, he, the ones he didn't like, he so clearly didn't like them, that they were pinned to the page in a way that robbed them of any kind of individuality. And I sometimes think that Orwell does sort of lay it on with the trowel when he's when he's got so it, it's it's the same kind of spirit that that overtakes him in the essay about his prep school such such were the joys um and you think there is clearly something odd psychological going on here because lots of lots of early 20th century english schoolboys wrote memoirs of the terrible time they had at prep school and several of them even wrote books about st cyprian's but nobody was quite so lacerated by the experience as all was himself um, the point the point you make about seeing those four early novels as the obvious precursors to Animal Farm in 1984, I've always thought, and the experience of annotating the novels convinced me of this, um, simply by the weight of evidence. In fact, all six of those books, the four naturalistic novels of the 1930s, and then the two dystopian fables, 1945 and 49, they are all ex essentially the same book, same plot, the rebellion that fails, um, the solitary person, the solitary intelligence, hemmed in by brutal autocracy, by a kind of surveillance. You see, even a clergyman's daughter has a surveillance culture. It's the kind of novel, uh, it's the kind of town, Orwell says, where, um, you know, which looks so peaceful unless, uh, unless you happen to have an enemy or a creditor at every window. And in fact, reading some of, um, it's, it's rather fascinating because there's some, um, I've been able to, I've been benefiting immensely from some new, uh, lots of new Orwell letters that have come to life recently from the South World period. And they show that his, um, his courtship of Eleanor Jakes, for example, in 1931, 1932, was, was virtually carried out under the eyes of the local townspeople. Um, it was, as, as you probably know, it was a Jules Ajim relationship. Um, he and a man called Dennis Collings were both after Eleanor Jakes, but she decided to marry Dennis in the end. And, um, and some of the letters, uh, I, I discovered a, a one recently, from, I think from about 1931, which is couched in terms of, I'd better not call, of your, I'd call at your house. We don't want a scandal. You know, we don't want people talking about it. So there is this sense, even in a clergyman's daughter, that everybody, every action is being scrutinised. Everything is kind of up for censure by, by some wider authority. And so each of those books works in the same way. You have, you have the, the, somebody makes what in the end turns out to be a rather futile rebellion. Um, there are various kind of adjustments. At the, the end of the novel, everything is more, sometimes not quite the same. So, uh, sometimes it all goes badly wrong. I mean, Flory at the end of Burmese days just shoots himself. But much more common, I think, is the, I mean, in some way, you know, the, the similarities between Dorothy Hare in A Clergyman's Daughter and Winston Smith in 1984 are simply that, um, you know, what has Dorothy done? She's, she goes back to her, she goes back to her father's rectory and uh, we see her at the end uh, you know, pacing up the jack boots again. What actually has changed in the way in which she regards the world? She's taken on the, the forces that are, trying, that are oppressing her and doing her down, and she has not managed to conquer them, and she has you know, reduced to going on what she had done before. So I was very struck in, in, in reading all the six novels again and then noting them and, and sort of trying to sort of work out their quirks and idiosyncrasies, that they were essentially all the same book. Even Animal, almost Animal Farm, it's a rebellion that fails. Mm. Yeah, I, I suppose the uh, although they're um, they're all um, character and life based, but they're the opposite of Bildung's Roman. They're, they're not novels about development. They're about no, they're novels about things which don't change. They're novels about exactly. They're novels about stasis, or they're novels or their attempts to break out of stasis. Mm. 
you know, to forge something else in the crucible of your aspirations, your psychological needs and desires. But the crucible ends up being smashed and, the, you know, the fragments are really all as they began. Um, the other thing, too, is that um, even with the, the, the two later novels, I was especially fascinated, um, as you can imagine, we're, we're doing them, they're being published in, in um, two, two per year. And as you can imagine, the publishers were keenest to begin with 1984 and Animal Farm because they're the, you know, obviously the, the two, but they, Bernie's Days and A Clergyman's Daughter, I'm afraid, won't be coming out till 2023 because they're down at the bottom of the pile of fashionability. But um, even um, I was very struck by the autobiographical resonances of both those novels. I mean, Animal Farm, for example, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's about a revolution that fails. It's... Um, quite obviously, and um, a satire of the Soviet revolution from its very beginnings, almost up until, until, the, until 1942, 1943. But this, for me, there's something else going on behind it. Um, I mean, the reader, the, the reader who comes to it cold will think to himself or herself, where is this, when historically is this actually taking place? I mean, it's a satire of the Soviet revolution, but it's yeah. grounded in rural England. Um, Mr. Jones, the man of farm and his wife, um, it's, it's almost unmechanized that unmechanized that farm. Um, it, Farmer Jones and his wife have a lithograph of Queen Victoria up in their front room. Um, even the newspapers that the pigs take in, you know, when they when they begin to sort of to, 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 <laughs> they begin to become anthropomorphized. Um, they are the kind of publications that ordinary people were reading around the time of the Great War. John Bull, the Daily Mirror, that sort of thing. The more I read it, the more I began to see that it's actually um, Orwell is recreating the sad box of cheer in his own childhood. So as well as being a satire of the Soviet revolution, to me, Animal Farm is actually a pay on to his lost Oxfordshire boyhood. You know, he was roaming the hills with Jacinta Budicum during the times of the Great War. So in other words, it's set historically 30, 40 years, at some point, between some of the, you know, the, the incidents in Eastern Europe yeah. it's, that it's satirized. The, the Daily Mirror you're mentioning there is obviously an old Daily Mirror. It wasn't the, the, the Daily Mirror of World War II, which was a radical... No, 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 very much not. No, it was the kind of thing that respectable um, bourgeoisie would read, i.e. the pigs who have just taken over the management of, of, of Manor Farm. But the same, the same, uh, there's the same autobiographical underpinning of 1984 when you get to the, um, the, the all the golden country passages where he's... Um, off, uh, you know, frolicking in a sylvan setting with um, Winston and Julia, because uh, this is something very ancient in Orwell's personal life, which again, I think goes, goes back to the hills above Henley, which is in the Vatican, around the time of the Great War. Um, Orwell's friend Tosco Feibel made the point that he tends to let himself go stylistically when he conflates his love of nature and his feelings towards women. And this is, I think this is a, this is a leitmotif of, of 1984 and some of its, you know, the passages out of the countryside when, when, when he and when Winston and Julia are sort of are off on the off on the Sylvan Trail. Mm. I, I think you're right, but the um, this this um, tendency of Orwell to use um, the rural idyll as a as a um, uh, as an assault on on the totalitarian vision is is even earlier. I mean um, it. It shows up in the 1938 review of um, Assignment in Utopia by Eugene Lyons, mm. um, a, 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 a great, a really black comic assault on Stalinism. Um, but the, the, the principle is imagine that uh, you're running a sweet shop and you've been convicted of sucking the humbugs and putting them back in the jar. Um, it's all based again on, on the rural village that uh, Orwell would have known walking out with his his sisters and his friends from Henley on Thames and Ship Lake into the surrounding countryside, but it, it it's another one of those features which he was prepared for long before he began writing 1984. It was part of his um, uh, immunization of himself against these uh, these threats. Orwell and Orwell's nature writing if we can call it that is quite interesting and again reading the novels at a single stretch one one notices just what happens to his style in the period from which he began writing um to, to the, the the two novels of the later period because um i mean the 
some of the imagery, some of the metaphor, the figurative language of, for example, Bernie, Burmese days could almost be written by some you know, sort of wild era esthete. I mean, some of the, the, the romantic language in which he describes the, the scenery of Burma is, is way over the top. And in fact, he remarks somewhere that um, if you go to the East, that a Westerner who goes to the East never really gets over uh, the scenery and the natural landscape. And, and in fact, there's um, <clears throat> one or two of the, the, the new letters that have just surfaced. Um, there's one to, um, again, to Eleanor Jakes, written when she and her husband were, were in the Far East because he became... Dennis became assistant curator of the Raffles Museum in Singapore, and he dilates for quite some time on, you know, the landscape of Burma and the effect that it has on his mind. Even as late as Keep the Asper Dystrophying, he's still capable of these sort of 90th, 90th flourishes. Uh, and there's a description of some teenage girls, I think, who Gordon Comstock goes past at a street market where they're, they're sort of described like, like flowers or aquarel washers or this, this kind of thing. Now, the all of 1984 would never have written like that. So he's, he's spending those early novels, if you like, getting some of the romantic, sort of almost pantheistic nature worship inside out of him, which is all sort of bound up with his style and the way in which he sees the natural world. So that, that's one way in which his writing does change. I think the, the, there is some sort of if not a development, then a regression, or certainly, a, certainly an idea of how you how you were supposed to write naturalistic prose over that uh, that fifteen year period of the six the six novels. Yeah, I mean I, that yeah, that's that's a good point because you know while he was writing his essay on the thoughts of the common toad about one particular April, mm. the, the April in which the ninth novel nineteen eighty four begins, of course, is is completely bleak, cold. Um, he he was able to divide the two completely um, and, and make 1984, the, the meteorology of 1984, something specific to it until they get out of the town into the countryside, the golden country, as you've, mm. if you've spoken about it. Uh, I'll take a, a point here. If, if anyone wants to raise questions by using, please do it by using the chat button at the bottom, which will put a text up the side and I can, as appropriate, feed them to David. Uh, at the moment, the only message I have so far is break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, 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 one of the interesting points, um, it, I, I think you've raised uh, somewhere else, is um, where small phrases and small ideas reoccur. Um, one of them is, is references uh, to uh, um, everything is dead, I am dead, you, and finally 1984's We Are the Dead. There's um, two or three different places where he plays with the idea of being inside the whale. It's, it's an idea throughout coming, coming up for air and then reoccurs in, in the essay called um, inside the whale he, he oh, it's, has it's the... possible to chart a lot of the a lot of the language a lot of the imagery so the metaphorical conceits of 1984 i think of, you know you can their depth charge you can track them way way back in the um, in some of the early writings and um you can also another interesting thing too in the um is the way in which you can see so even, even 1984 which after all is a dystopia um you know projected into um <clears throat> into a terrible future but you can see the way in little incidental things that um Orwell is coming across at the time of writing i mean details from his own not simply things he has read but things are actually happening around him uh, i mean he was he was i would think about halfway through the the first draft of 1984 in the spring it's probably the june of 1947 and um, you know the, the 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 famous passage in which um, Winston and Julia are, are, are sitting in their lying in their love nest above Mr. Charrington's shop, uh, and a rat suddenly appears at the wainscoting. Julia throws something at it. Oh, you know, a rat of all things. And she then she then sort of begins to lecture Orwell. It's a terribly kind of graphic piece of dialogue. She says, you know, they, uh, you know, in some of the in some of the proletarian districts, you know, a woman a woman can't leave her baby for two minutes before the brutes, and they always have to, they always go for the and then Winston says, no, stop, don't say any more. And in Orwell's diary for June 1947, we find a reference to a newspaper, you know, that some and Ardlassa, the nearest town. Um, from Barnhill Farmhouse, where two children bitten by rats in the face as usual. And so clearly, uh, it, it, there's no way of knowing, you know, from what survives of the draft, when he actually wrote, the actual date on which he wrote that passage. 
but it, it, it's too good to be true, that connection between having read something in the local paper and then feeding it into the... Um, uh, but, but some of those, some of those, those, those stimuli go back, you know, a decade and a half. Um, I mean, I've written before about the origins of um, uh, <clears throat> when the, the famous scene in the Ministry of Love when Winston is sitting next to um, um, a, a prisoner who's obviously starving. And the man next to him brings out a piece of bread and tries to hand it to the starving man, whereupon the telescreen, telescreen erupts and goes, Bumstead, Bumstead J2173, let fall that piece of bread. Now, this is a reference to a man called Jack Bumstead, who was the son of Mr. George Bumstead, the Southwold grocer, uh, whose premises have almost abutted um, the All Orwell's parents' house in Southwold, High Street in 1933-1934. So 15 years later, Jack Bumstead's euphonious Suffolk name had stuck in Orwell's head to the point that he was able to introduce it to the name of a minor character in a dystopian novel. That's, that's what I mean about kind of picking up bits of debris and then sort of carefully repositioning them in something you're writing, in this case, a decade and a half later. Yeah. The, um, we've, we've had one question, which is, which is quite a simple one, although even this is, is, is how long was Orwell on Jura? It was mentioned in a talk by Michael Morpurgo the other day on Point of View. Right. Well, a um, couple of visits, a couple of holidays to sort of suss the place out. Um, then arrangements had to be made, uh, facilitated by his friend David Astor. Hook up residence properly for the summer of 1946. Left it again in the autumn uh, to go back to London for the bitter winter of 1946-47 which which Orwell was actually convinced that was what fatally ruined his health, having sort of you know the the, the London um, <clears throat> the London chills of 1946-7. Returned in April 1947 um, to get on with writing the first draft. Um, 1940 taken off to Haymars Hospital after he got ill. Returned to Jura. Um, finished the final draft, left Jura in January 1949 and never went back. So in terms of actual time spent there, not a huge amount, but the, the, the very decisive influence on his life, obviously the place where he finished his final novel and the place where he, you know, more or less killed himself to, to write it, I think it's fair to say. I think there's a question, no one's quite sure if he actually spent a week or two in, in the autumn of 1945 there. That's right. There is a, he, we said, no, he certainly had a holiday. There is, a, there, is, there is some doubt as to whether he went up before that, I think, and did, and did a wreck. He certainly went there on holiday uh, in 1945, but the first proper stakeout was in 1946. Yeah. Uh, and, and now, um, in your annotated editions, are you going to do the three books of reportage? The down no, and not. Just, it's just the six novels. Just the six novels. I mean, because uh, Gilbert Mackay has asked, how does a work like Down and Out in Paris and London link to his later work? How does it link to his later work? Uh, um, well, it, yeah. <clears throat> well, I suppose the answer to that is that um, ultimately it's all of a piece and that the sensibility you see... Um, forging itself in the early 1930s is, is being true to itself 15, 16 years later when he gets on to the 1984. I suppose the, um, in terms of actual sort of, um, I suppose one could, uh, the, there's a kind of bleakness and a harshness about, about, about some of the descriptions and the language, I suppose, and the, um, the absolutely precise observations. I mean, the, 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 one of the passages that always strikes me um, in Down and Out in Paris and London is the, um, you know, where he describes the sensations of what you actually feel like and what happens to you physio physiologically if you don't have enough to eat. You know, well notice things like your spittle suddenly becomes different, you know, you suddenly, and, but there's also too, another thing about him, uh, another thing that one notices even at this stage is that although he's writing about unpleasant experiences, which um, as we know in 15 years time again have mutated into outright horrors, there's still this kind of fastidiousness. You know, I'm always very struck by the fact that um, there's the scene where he's, he's boiling his last saucepan full of milk and a bug drops into it, uh, which, of course, is, you know, the whole thing is spoiling. Kind of, most people, I think, in those circumstances would simply spoon the bug out, thrown it on the floor and stamped on it, and gone on and drink, drunk the milk. But oil isn't like that. Even when supposedly starving and in, and, you know, in an extremely penurious condition, he's still, he's still all well, you know, he's still the... Uh, lower upper middle class boy, as he put himself, who's, um, <laughs> you know. And I mean, one, actually, one of the, another of the interesting things, so this is, a, this is going off on a tangent, but I think it is actually pertinent to what you're saying. 
one of the things one does notice about all of those novels is what a public schoolboy Orwell is and what an Etonian he is. Um, I mean, in, in just the same way as he describes, he describes one of the waiters, I think, in Down and Out as looking like an eaten boy. I mean, the, the, when uh, that marvellous scene in which, which uh, Gordon is, Gordon Comstock in Keep the Ass Flying is out of one of his brooding walks and quite by chance um, bumps into um, Rosemary, his girlfriend, and she's wearing a rather nice hat. And of course, all well, immediately says, and it was, it was a shovel hat, like a Harrow boy's hat. And you think to yourself, well, how many readers would know what a Harrow boy's hat looked like in 1930? But that's what he does, you see. He can never, and, and quite properly, there's not a complaint about all this, what everybody does. He can never quite get over his origins. And um, as, you know, as, as somebody said that, um, I think it was Anthony Pohl said that, uh, you know, the shabbier and shabbier his clothes got, the more, the, you know, the more distinguished he looked in them because they were such well-cut clothes that a gentleman would have cut for himself. I think the same thing is probably true of his fiction. Well, yes, if we, if we go back to um, someone you've mentioned earlier, Norman Collins, the, the first meeting of Orwell and Collins when they were agreeing the, the contract to publish um, Burmese Days, uh, that Collins said that uh, Orwell shambled in looking, you know, almost like a tramp. Uh, but that was simply because his clothes were worn out because he didn't have the money, presumably. Um, but you, he could always be spotted for what he was. In fact, there's an interesting, uh, there's a very interesting personal connection here because I'm sitting here in a, in a rented holiday cottage in Kersey, in Suffolk, a lovely little village in Suffolk. Now, three doors down from the cottage where we're staying was the house lived in towards the end of his life by Orwell's friend, Peter Van Sittert, whom I'm sure some of the people were aware. And by an even bigger coincidence, I walked into a second-hand bookshop in Hadley, three miles away this afternoon, and I picked up a copy of V.S. Pritchett's last collection of essays, signed by Pritchett to Van Sittert. So there's two Orwell connections on the same page there. But I have always remember, and I think this is such a characteristic story that Peter Van Sittert told me. Um, in fact, he told it when we were sitting over a cup of tea three houses away about 20 years ago. And uh, when he was, he would then have been about 22, 23, and Orwell would give him reviews to write for Tribune. And Orwell took him to a pub near the Tribune offices in the Strand and sat him down. They were provided with pints of beer. And uh, Van Sitter said, Orwell always, always wanted a pint, you know, a pint. It was a kind of proletarian thing to do. And, and Orwell began to lecture him about, and he said to uh, Peter, Peter Van Sitter had, I think, been to Haleybury, you know, a very respectable public school. He was, a, he was a kind of very well dressed, elegant young man. And so Orwell said to him, Peter, you must understand that uh, with an accent like yours and wearing a tie like yours, you will never be accepted by the working classes as one of themselves. And of course, Peter Van Sitter didn't want to be accepted by the working classes. He was quite happy with being who he was. And as Orwell had delivered himself of this pronouncement, the, um, the Republican came across to see if they wanted any more beer and said, you know, can I, can I get you gents any more? So he looked at Peter Van Sitter and said, what about you, Peter? Then he looked at Orwell and said, sir? He immediately spotted Orwell for a gentleman. You see, there was no way in which he could carry off this masquerade. I remember that this afternoon, picking up this one of what was a, a book that had obviously come from Peter Van Sittert's library some years ago. If, if we go back to um, uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, there, there's a, an, an incredible phrase in there, um, which came back to my attention because somebody tweeted it earlier this week. Um, uh, something that, that, that one of the qualities of poverty is that it annihilates time um, because you, you don't think about the future. Um, and in fact, the concepts of time are something which, which are, runs through all of, of Orwell's work, you know, right through to, and, it, and then it shows up most significantly, um, as you've mentioned, for instance, in... Um, the first sentence of a clergyman's daughter about the little bomb exploding next mm. to Dorothy's head. And of course, in the first sentence of, um, of 1984. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I, a lot of people look at me oddly when I point out that 1984 is not, is not just a year, but 1984 on a 24-hour clock is an impossible time. 1984 is actually... 24 minutes past eight in the evening it's it's 2024 if you've got a clock which goes up to 1984 then you something peculiar is happening but um it it's it's one of those elements which isn't um so well known but um i've got an anthology of of, of essays but 
I think there was uh, some sort of symposium in Washington, D.C. in 1984 where Bernard Crick was there. Mm. And there's one guy just looks at all the references to time in 1984. One of the significant things is that Winston never knows the time himself. He always relies on external devices. It's the telescreen coming on and waking him up or the person who has a cl uh, the, the clock in the Charrington's room is wrong. Mm. Mm. The um, but O'Brien has a wristwatch. That's well. That's part. That's being in the inner party for you. See, you're not. You're not merely controlling the past and the future. You're controlling time itself, I suppose. Yes. Um, or it's a, but no, the 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 novels are full of. I mean, I suppose it's. I, I have to concede. I mean, I'm not an academic, but I concede that this is what scholarship does, and that the deeper you get into something the more things you find out, and then you go on endlessly. And um, I'm not quite sure where all this is going to lead. I mean, in the 17, 18 years since I uh, produced my biography of Orwell, I mean, Orwell scholarship has gone exponential. There, I can see from the screen at the top of this, uh, <coughs> of my computer, that there are several Orwell scholars known to me who are watching this. I'm sure they'd agree <laughs> that the whole thing has gone, like Niagara Falls, a torrent of Orwell scholarship is now pouring over the... Uh, pouring over the press walls, and I don't know where it's going to end. And there is so much stuff out there. Every, um, you know, every little every little paragraph that I started examining in the clergyman's daughter tended to take me somewhere else. And there's a point where, you know, a madness supervenes, and I think you go too far and fall off the, the edge and find yourself not en engaging in scholarship at all, but simply turning up detail, almost for detail's sake. I mean, the... the um, you know, just to give you an idea, the, the, the last two or three years have, have, have resulted in many more Orwell letters coming to light, letters to Brenda Southell, letters, letters to Eleanor Jakes, letters to Cyril Connolly, uh, this kind of thing. And, and each of, you know, each of those collections is probably worth a book in themselves. Uh, you know, there are something like two dozen new letters to Brenda Salkel we now have. Here. And these are these are not just sort of, you know, paragraph longer. One or two of them are kind of, you know, some of the ones to Ellen are, you know, come to tea on Thursday or where the blazes were you when you said you'd be by Smith's bookstore at 2.30 and I was there and what happened. But some of them are really long and detailed. I mean, I've just come across a wonderful letter to... Um, uh, to Eleanor, written just after he's come back from Spain in 1937, and it sets out in three pages, more succinctly and more kind of epigrammatic, epigrammatic than I've ever seen before, what he thinks about Spain, what he saw there, the Spanish situation and the politics. Now, this is probably worth several scholarly articles, I would have thought, but uh, I know that it'll probably be a couple of paragraphs, if that, in, you know, Orwell 2.0, which is fermenting as we speak. Um, there, there is so much stuff out there. In fact, somebody I was having, a, you mentioned earlier, um, Les, you, you mentioned Dorian Linsky's book, and I did a podcast with Dorian earlier this year, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> in which he um, he asked some question about, you know, he, he took some particular theme as people do and said, what do you think of Orwell? You know, what would Orwell thought of that? What does Orwell's work tell us about this? And I said, well, actually, Dorian, in some ways, um, it's a bit like the Reverend Lovejoy in The Simpsons, you know, when he's asked, what does the Bible say about this? And he picks up the Bible and he goes, well, the Bible's got a whole lot of stuff in it and you could use it to explain almost anything away. And sometimes I think looking at those 20 volumes of the collect Peter Davison's wonderful edition, which of course have now been expanded, there's a 21st volume and there's enough other stuff out there to, to fill a 22nd and a 23rd. I sometimes think that it would be impossible to make a case almost for anything. <laughs> to, you know, if you, if you if you filleted your evidence carefully out of those out of those those mighty works. I mean, somebody was asking me just the other day, um, an American correspondent wanted to who picked up something that the late Christopher Hitchens had written about Orwell in the New York uh, Review of Books years and years ago. Was asking about um, what Orwell thought about Spain, and um, of course. Ultimately, Orwell's views about the Spanish Civil War in which he'd fought and been shot through the throat and nearly died, you know, at the hands of a fascist sniper. In the end, Orwell's views about Spain were extraordinarily nuanced and, and objective in a way that you would think almost impossible for someone who'd been shot. And he said, uh, he said, to, um, he said to Anthony Pohl, I think at one point, he said that, um, yes, obviously it was a great struggle between right and left in Spain in 1937, but really Orwell said, this, you know, the, the, the army you ended up fighting for in Spain pretty much depended on where you lived. Uh, and so, you know, he's almost, it's, it, you can make exactly the same point about the English Civil War, but to find, you know, an actual 
a Spanish Civil War ideologue who'd been chased out of the country by the Soviet hit squad, actually you know, being as objective as that about the Spanish Civil War is really rather astonishing. Did he, did he mean that, um, for instance, that, uh, that Madrid was more sympathetic to the communists and Barcelona was sympathetic to the anarchists? Or I think he's, I think was he he's thinking of an even smaller scale? I think he, he was. I think he was simply mentioned. He simply meant it in terms of political geography, in that certain regions went certain ways because of the, uh, you know, the forces exerted upon. I mean, rather in the same way, the English Civil War. You know, if you lived in Cornwall, you supported the king because Cornwall supported the king. Small, poor, rural. I think he was. He was just making that. He also said, you know, that he there was no. He said there was no case to be made for fascism, but there was certainly. He said that in, objectively, certain individual fascists had a case. And that's an extraordinary thing. It was almost on a par with the essay about not being able to dislike Hitler mm. or to hate Hitler, you know, when he reviews Mein Kampf. Um, it's, uh, there, there is some extraordinary stuff in there that needs sedulously unpicking um, and could be unpicked and unpicked. And then those unpickings could be unpicked as well. I mean, I'm sure the Orwell, <coughs> the Orwell Society Journal is well on the case about all of this, but I, I sometimes look at the, you know, the, the, the wealth period myself you know, oh dear me. Yes, and 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 yet in other ways, Orwell had to had to control himself. Um, I, I think that um, what after after nineteen forty three, when he wrote, looking back on the Spanish War, he 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 remained relatively quiet on on anything that was happening in Spain. Yes, I think he I think he did, and it, it that that too raises the question of um, what Orwell said to the people closest to him about uh, you know, the incidents in his past life, which he did sometimes tend to mythologize. And there were close friends um, to whom, I mean, I remember again, Anthony Pohl saying that um, Orwell would never say anything about his time in Paris or France other than the most casual remark, general remark about, of course, you know, one got the Metro to the such and such stage. He would never say anything other than that. And similarly, he once, um, he once said to um, Lady, Lady Violet Pohl was asking him about um, you know what it had been like in Burma, and he said that oh you know, he he said that you know all the all the Burmese all the police officers had mistresses without revealing whether he had one himself, which of course is the information which uh, you know which is one of those great Orwell questions the biographers have agonised over for years. So um, he can be very revealed. One of the fascinating things actually about some of the new letters that have turned up, which is I find. I really found quite surprising is that um, Orwell, if Orwell, he certainly he kept his friends in fairly tightly closed compartments so that people who knew him would then be surprised to know that he knew somebody else because they would never have been introduced to them. Um, but he would, um, he was capable and he wouldn't necessarily talk intimately about himself, his close friend, but he was capable of opening up and unburdening himself in rather unusual ways to complete strangers. So, for example, if you wrote him a letter, if you wrote him a fan letter, this is especially true of the latter period of his life. And people who, I mean, um, uh, I mean, Richard Osborne, the letter of the editor of The Strand, wrote to him asking him to write something for him in 1947. And Orwell didn't actually think that he could execute the commission, but he supplied two and a half pages of biographical details talking about himself in really sort of very almost sort of quasi intimate detail in a way that he wouldn't speak to his closest friends. And there are several letters like that, which, which, which make you feel sometimes that he was better at unburdening himself to people he didn't know than, than, than talking to people that he knew in terms of comparative intimacy. That's a very okay. interesting psychological puzzle too. Okay, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, so that's the Richard Osborne you're mentioning who wrote the book Clubland Heroes. That's the one, yeah, yeah. Edited of the Strand uh, if, magazine in the 40s. Yeah. If, so if you if you if you are interested in in Orwell's <clears throat> studies of popular literature, then one of the books you should read is is Clubland Heroes by Richard Usborne. Um, another one is um, by Colin Watson, um, Snobbery with Violence. Both very good. Um, we're going to I'm going to invite one last question. But before I invite that last question, I'll point out that uh, I don't know if you've seen, David, that uh, joining us tonight, we have Quentin Kopp. And Quentin, Quentin has done some, Quentin has done a bit more research about his father and has discovered mm. that uh, when his father, Georges, married his mother, Doreen, um, one of the witnesses was Eric Blair. 
And I know this because Richard Blair very kindly sent me a copy of the marriage certificate two or three oh. days ago. So this is how Orwell scholarship works, you see. This <laughs> tightly, tightly knit group of people. It makes us sound like the Communist Party. And they, wasn't it how, no, Harold Wilson described the Siemens Union in the 1960s. And he was this tightly knit group of conspirators doing but they, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, right it's, now, it, now if, we're all if, working if, towards a common common cause, fortunately. Yes. Yeah. Now, if um, if you don't want to type, if if somebody quickly wants to unmute and ask a question, okay, Michael King. Thanks, Les. Um, very interesting evening. This very interesting indeed. Um, I've been doing a bit of research recently into the now deeply unfashionable poet, Alfred Noyes. Um, and in 1940, he published a novel called The Last Man, very close to Orwell, one of Orwell's earlier um, names for 1984. And Orwell wrote a terribly complimentary review of this novel. Um, I can't get hold of it, it's almost unobtainable. Just wondered if you footnoted that at all, David, in your or going to in your 1984. Well, you see, this is what I mean about the tendrils of Orwell scholarship, Michael, going out in all kinds of different directions. I mean, there are um, there are all kinds of, of, of I mean, another one, another one which is always supposed to have had an influence on him is Swastika Night, um, published in, I think, 1937. We can't prove that he read it, but it was published by the Left Book Club. It's quite possible that Galant sent him one. We just don't know. Um, it's so, um, you know, the, the I mean, I, I you know, speaking professionally, the way in which novelist's mind works um, are almost beyond comprehension sometimes. You know, the way in which phrases, titles are picked up, the way in which, um, you know, you have something written on a piece of paper from 10 years ago that you think, I'm going to make use of this sometime. I don't know quite now how I am. In fact, I'll give you an example. We were, my wife and I were just driving back in the car this morning. We passed a road sign that said Rumble Strips. And I said to her, I've been wanting to write a short story called Rumble Strips for the last 30 years, and I've never managed to do it, but the note is still in the notebook somewhere. And so it's perfectly possible. And I remember I, I remember being shown after he died, Anthony Pohl uh, left a literary notebook that was clearly very, very ancient because it was um, it had been it had been commenced in an old um, Duckworth publisher's block, which was clearly dated from the early 1930s. And in it, Hold had scribbled little words and fragments and little ideas. And you could sometimes, you could see that it had taken 40, I mean, he lived a very long time. He lived many four and a half decades longer than his friend Orwell. But you could see that in some time, occasion, it had taken 40 years for that little fragment to make its way through into a sentence or the name of a character. And I'm sure Orwell did the same thing. I mean, you know, you can... Um, you can see sometimes in his literary notebooks the way in which he writes down ideas and things. Uh, you know, there's the famous time in um, you know you can you can almost see him thinking aloud in the in the Road to Wigan Pier diary. I think he goes past he goes past a frozen lake and he can hear the ice box planking planking together and there's the cigarette packet floating on the top. And he thinks memo put this in a novel. <laughs> I don't recall that he ever actually did, but clearly you know that was the way the way his mind worked. It'd be quite possible if he'd lived another five years if he'd ever written. A smoking room story, you know, the fragments of which were left at his death, um, the story about the young man coming back on the boat from Burma, who knows, perhaps that image would have come into it, because that, that is the way that novelists' mind work. Yeah. Minds work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Oh, that's, a wonderful, that's, a, that's a wonderful piece of detective work, Michael. I congratulate you on that. Thank you. Brilliant. I just, I just need to get hold of the book, but it's, well, it's is, about nine hundred pounds online. <laughs> this is the problem, isn't it, about some yeah. of these these obscure items from way from yeah. way back? I'm afraid. I Thank said that was much. going to be the last question, but someone called John is waving his hand. Do you <clears> want to? <throat> do you have a question, John? Uh, John McManus is my name. It's just not all on the screen. Thank you. Um, Thank you. The uh, the relationship with Jack Common, I think, is fascinating. And it seems that they approached each other from completely different perspectives in that Orwell was a middle class man who was contemptuous of his class and desperate to identify with a working man. And Common was a working man who was terrified of betraying his class. And, and it, that seemed to be a dynamic within them. And uh, I just wondered if you think there's anything in that. I think that's very interesting. I mean, I, I'm always very struck by... Um... <clears throat> Common's description of how they first met when Orwell turned up at the Adelphi office. I think they had a cup of tea and a cigarette. That was the way in which you, you kind of made friends in Boomsbury in those days, the early 1930s. 
<clears throat> and I think that some all, uh, common, it was very interesting on um, Orwell's class consciousness, I think, at that point, and the way, I mean, it, 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 to me, is a subject of huge fascination, I must admit. Orwell, I mean, there's, there, I mean, I'm sure theses have been written on Orwell and the working class, but the way in which he was determined, not only was he determined to identify with people like Jack Common, but he, he went out of his way, I mean, I was telling the Peter Van Sittert story earlier, he actually, he had a habit of taking people, middle-class people that he knew didn't like pubs. He had a habit of taking them into pubs, noticing their discomfort, and then kind of lecturing them about it. You see, there's a, there's a marvelous story. He had, a, he had, a, he had a, a, a colleague at the BBC called John Morris, a fellow pr producer, whom he got on very badly with. They just didn't hit it off. They were both in the same social path and always very suspicious of him and used to criticize him. And, he, oh, and, one, and Morris didn't like pubs. So Orwell took him into, the, or took him into a, a working class pub one evening and said, you know, what do you have? And Morris, he didn't want to be there. So I'll... Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a pint of uh, I'll have a pint of bitter. No, no, that, no. He said I'll have I'll have beer. To which Orwell said, "Oh, you you betrayed yourself there." <laughs> and Morris said, "What do you mean? You've given yourself away there. No working class man would ever ask for beer. You ask for a pint of bitter." To which Morris said, "But I'm not working class." To which uh, to which Orwell said, "Well, there's no need to brag about it." <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but then, of course, as, 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 as the point I was making earlier, Orwell himself was so conspicuously not at home himself in that review. I mean, George Woodcock writes very interestingly in the, in the biographical sections, the Christmas spirit uh, writes about, there was a big sort of, of almost a sort of old style Victorian gin palace around the corner from Canonbury Square, Orwell's flat. And he used to go there with George Woodcock and, 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 and Woodcock said, why did he do it? He was like a fish out of water in there. He obviously didn't relate to the people in there and they didn't relate to him, but he thought that he was communing uh, you know, with, with the soul of the British proletariat by going in there, and it, it really didn't work. And so you're you're right. The, the the common relationship is. I mean, it's interestingly, it's 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 one of the closest relationships he had with an authentic working class person. They were great friends, and um, you know, Common was allowed to live in Wallingford while while the Orwells were away, and they were clearly very very intimate. And Common writes very interestingly about him. So I I, I think that, that that that's probably one of his most fascinating relationships with someone who was demonstrably outside his class. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, and, and Orwell, in turn, had introduced Jack Common to Alan Clutton Brock. Mm, the art critic uh, of the times. Yeah, old yeah. Etonian, king scholar. Yeah. Yes, and, and Clutton Brock allowed him to live mm. as, 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 the, uh, as the caretaker at, uh, at his country mansion um, until they fell out, as apparently Jack Common fell out with many people. Mm. One, one has heard this, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I think uh, I think Kim is uh, sorry. Kay is is asking us to um, to to wrap up now. I'm afraid um, we've gone. On, I'm afraid we've gone on a bit. It's quarter past seven. I'm sorry about this, but you see, that's I all well. That's all well enthusiasts for you, I'm afraid. Anyway, well, uh, so we'll we'll look forward to the first two volumes of your annotated editions, and I hope that we've also mentioned a few books which uh, you'd like to read to follow up. The one. Um, which I'll have to get through a library, which I still think is very good, is William Steinhoff's The Road to 1984. Um, I don't know what you think about that book, uh, David. Uh, I so, can't say I've ever read it, I'm afraid. Oh, it's, it's, it's in, some, in some ways it's, 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 it's been, it's replaced by um, uh, uh, Dorian Litsky's book, but it's, um, it's very good, particularly on the influence of um, Eugene Lyons. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I can see that Masha Karp, who knows it, is, is agreeing. Yes, I can see Masha nodding. <laughs> yes. So um, I, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Lit and Phil for this opportunity, and I'd like to thank David Taylor for agreeing to mm. talk to us. It was great and, fun, uh, Les. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you very much. Would you like to uh, wrap up now, Kay? Thank you. Thank you. Word, word of thanks. Um, it's been a fascinating evening. I'm sure we all agree it's been wonderful to be part of this conversation and to contribute to it. Um, I'm, I hope the next time we meet it is in person um, uh, at the Little Phil and an open invitation to the Royal Society and of course an open invitation to David 
to visit us again. I'm looking forward to it already, Kay. I can't thank wait. You. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And um, keep reading. Good night, everybody.